What this is, is, uh, is actually called Five Tips of Being an Effective Second Amendment Activist. And what I did is I took a seminar on how to be a Second Amendment activist that was actually like, like eight hours long, and I truncated it. <laughs> I, uh, I, I boiled it down to, uh, to a, a much less than eight hours. But it's still more than one hour, and it's actually still more than five tips. So we're just going to roll, um, and uh, hopefully you guys will pick up some really good um, pieces here and some of the things that we've done. Oops, out of order. So here, so we're going to talk about uh, what activism actually is so that people understand. Hey, man. We're going to actually talk about the definition of activism, what activism really is, because I think people use activism very broadly and uh, as a result aren't effective in getting done what needs to get done. We're going to talk about increasing your credibility. We're going to talk about what activist activities really are. We're going to talk a little bit about the press and the elected and some of the antis and then organizing in general. Uh, my name is Michael Schwartz, by the way. I'm the founder of San Diego County Gun Owners. We've also uh, have Orange County Gun Owners, Inland Empire Gun Owners, and a brand new 501c3 to support our women's program called Not Me California. Uh, we've been an activist since about 2008, voluntarily. And then uh, in 2015, we launched San Diego County Gun Owners. And I would uh, assert that San Diego County Gun Owners is the most effective activist organization in San Diego County, possibly California in general. Um, and uh, I'd put our record up against just about anybody. I got to tell you, we've done a lot in a short amount of time with, uh, with not a whole lot of resources, and we've grown exponentially. It's been great. I'm always really impressed when somebody comes up and asks, well, uh, hey, uh, where are your headquarters? And the reason is, is they look at our website and they look at our, they listen to our radio show and they see all the things that we're doing, and they assume we're this big, huge, you know, pile of money sitting somewhere, but I got to tell you, we've been pulling ourselves up by the bootstraps and getting things done uh, with, uh, you know, uh, with very little resources, with a whole lot of people putting in a whole lot of hard work. And I, I, I'm very appreciative of that. San Diego County Governors, if you don't know, we're a political organization focused on Second Amendment issues just in the county. We try to get uh, local people elected on local boards and councils so they can eventually move up and serve in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. We don't care where they stand on any other issue. and We don't care what party they belong to as long as they're pro-Second Amendment. Okay, so what is activism? <clears throat> so the definition of activism, the policy or action of using vigorous campaigning to bring about political or social change. So it implies effectiveness. I think a lot of people, I think a lot of people think that activism is just having an opinion or is just being loud, you know, or it's just reading an article, you know, and now they're an expert and they talk about it. Uh, one of my pet peeves is when, when people use the word support. Well, I support the Second Amendment. How? You know, support's a verb. So what exactly are you doing to support the Second Amendment? Typically, that's uh, candidates or elected officials. Uh, but sometimes it's people that, uh, you know, come up and say, hey, how come we don't have this? Or how come we can't get that? Or what are you guys doing to, to make, so I can have a blah, 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 right? I'm like, well, you know, do you support the Second Amendment? Oh, yeah, I support the Second Amendment. How? What exactly do you actually do to support the Second Amendment? You know, um, there are, what, what activities do you actually do? What, what, what steps are you actually taking? Uh, you know, and I think a lot of people think that they, they support or they uh, confuse the word support with, you know, opinion. You know, I have a positive opinion of the Second Amendment. That's really what they're talking about. What I want to talk about, what we specialize in is real true activism, which has to do with activities, things that you do to actually change public policy so that public policy is now different. It could be through uh, official, elected officials. You know, it could be through a border council actually changing a law or regulation. It could be through changing people's minds um, on a broad scale so that now culturally things have changed. That's much harder, right? And sometimes one leads the other. Um, sometimes public policy leads culture. Sometimes culture leads public policy. You've seen that in a lot of different other civil rights movements and, and uh, you know, and sometimes uh, it works best really when they work together. When you're changing the culture and you're changing the public policy and you're taking steps to do both and they both kind of change at once. And it's funny, I think about all the time, um, you know, you see, speaking of civil rights, you see like the Civil Rights Act in the 60s 
you know, and when they uh, would bus African Americans into schools, you know, and say, hey, you know, and you'd have protesters sitting there. And I, I look at these pictures of, of very normal looking people um, in the background protesting, you know, uh, protesting African Americans going into schools. And those, the folks that are pro in these pictures, this is the 60s. It wasn't that long ago. You know, they didn't live that far away from us. And I wonder, like, wow, how much has the culture changed, probably in line with, uh, with public policy, and what, is that per what, what has that person done the rest of their life? You know, here they are, 35 years old. They're in the background of a picture where they're protesting, you know, black kids going to a school. And now they're going to live with that picture the rest of their life. I would be willing to bet that the culture changed around them, and they probably changed with it. But I've always thought it'd be interesting, and, and maybe a lot of them are too old now and have passed or whatever, but, uh, well, I don't know, if you're 35, 40 in the 60s, you're probably still around, right? But I just thought it'd be really interesting if uh, a, a reporter found them and talked to them. Okay, that's the 60s. Where were you in the 70s? What were you doing in the 80s? You know, what were you doing in the 90s? Because I'd be willing to bet that, that the activists that changed pub or public policy also changed culture, and they both kind of changed at the same time. I'd be willing to bet that a lot of those people were like, wow, I was on the wrong side there. I was on the wrong side of history. I was on the wrong side. And there are a lot of different other civil rights examples, not just in the United States, but across the world in other countries um, where, um, you know, things have changed. People are on, and, you know, it's, it's, it would now, what, what people supported just 10, 20 years ago would now be considered political suicide. You know, they were hell bent on being anti whatever. And now, if you're anti whatever it is, you know, it's political suicide. So what we're trying to do as activists is change public policy as well as culture, probably both at the same time, so they work together. So one of the ways to do that, oops, excuse me a sec, guys. is to increase your credibility. <clears throat> so one of the tips um, that I have to being an activist is to increase your credibility. And, and what that means, you know, everybody's got an opinion. Everybody has an opinion. But in order to have an effect on culture and have an effect especially on public policy, someone's got to listen to your opinion. Uh, someone's got to say, hey, this person's onto something. Let's move in that direction. And there are a lot of different ways they can do that or why they would do that. But one of the things is you have to improve your credibility. Now, I was an activist in favor of the Second Amendment from 2008 to 2015, before we started San Diego County Gun Owners. And I gotta tell you, nobody cared what I had to say. Very few people. I had people that agreed with me and said, yeah, me too, Mike, see you later. But until I said, hey, you know what? We have this organization, I'm a part of this organization, you know, that's when people started, that's when it mattered. That's when, when what we were saying about the Second Amendment and guns and California gun law, that's when it actually started to matter. Before then, there was a lot of pats on my head. There was a lot of placating. There was a lot of, yeah, all right, yeah, whatever, you know, okay. But as long as it gets me elected or doesn't, you know, I don't want to rock the boat here. <clears throat> so the ability to say, here's who I am, here's my background and what I represent is crucial, especially when you're talking to Elected officials. Now, in their defense, you know, some of these elected officials represent hundreds of thousands of people. You know, they can't talk to every single person. So they have to look for, hey, who, who, who's the thought leader, you know, in this subject? And they have to listen to that person. You know, if they can talk to one person who represents, you know, 10,000 people, you know, that's a lot better than talking to 10,000 people. They simply can't do that. So increasing your credibility, getting a certification, you know, getting some kind of position, you know, hey, I'm the Second Amendment uh, leader in the, uh, you know, in my uh, XYZ group or whatever. You know, I've been elected president for, you know, I'm the, I'm the Second Amendment uh, committee leader for my HOA or whatever, right? <laughs> some kind of title, some kind of, you know, I'm an NRA certified instructor, you know, uh, some kind of title, some kind of certification will set you apart from the general masses. You know, just standing there with a bullhorn saying, hey, I have an opinion is far less effective than, hey, here, here's who I am. Here are my credentials. Here's what I do. And that's why my opinion needs to be heard. And of course, looking the part too. 
See, did I include that? I cut that out. Did I cut that out? Uh, we're coming up on it. We'll talk a little bit about looking the part as well. So there's only two tools. If you've heard our radio show, if you've come to one of our meetings, you've probably heard me say this before. You have two tools in politics and that's it. Nothing else matters. Your opinions don't matter. How good your opinion is, doesn't matter. How well thought out your opinion is, how beautifully written your white paper is, doesn't matter. You have two tools in politics, people and money. And that's it. That is it. You know, you can be as right as right can possibly be, but if you have no people behind you and no money to finance it, it nothing happens. Nothing happens. Uh, you know, the poly in politics, what does that stand for? What does that actually, what does that mean in Latin? It's like blood sucker or something. It's the stuff, right? No, poly is people. It's people. You have to have people. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, the people and money, that's it. If you have great ideas that will change the world, and you have no people, no money behind you, nothing will happen. If you have horrible ideas and you have a ton of people and a ton of money behind it, you're California, right? You get anything you want implemented. It doesn't matter, you know? And the, the, the fact is, if you have a million dollars and a thousand people and the other group has a million and one dollars, and a thousand and one people, who's probably going to win? It's, it's, it really boils down to that. Now, I know that's not romantic to say. And I know we all wish that it wasn't about money. We got to get money about politics. Until that happens, until human nature changes, people and money. That's it. Activism is a big part of gathering people and money. You know, getting more people behind a cause, finding more, fun, more, finding more money to fund that cause. So... If you're an activist, if you really truly want to be effective and you're doing an activity and you sit down and think to yourself, this isn't getting more people involved and it isn't raising more money, it probably isn't effective activism. Does that make sense? Again, I recognize, well, Mike, that stinks. That's not the way the world should be. I hear you. But I'm not here to tell you how I wish things were. I'm here to tell you how things are and how, why we've been successful. Because we focus entirely on people and money. Everything we do, we want to make sure, hey, will this get more people involved? Will this raise more money? Because those are the two things that help us restore and preserve your Second Amendment rights. Everything we do, that runs through my head. <clears throat> Anything you do that is not raising people or money is not activism. It's a pretty strong statement. I'm not sure it's totally 100%. I, I still stand by that statement, but darn close. Darn close. If you're doing something that's not raising people or money, it's probably not activism. So let's talk about in a pro, act, effective is, uh, being effective is judging whether or not things work, right? So let's talk about work because I, after I talk about this and after I kind of fleshed this out for myself, um, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see what I saw in that when you're looking at uh, two people argue on CNN or Fox or wherever, it's one of the cable news. And they talk about, hey, we're, this works. Well, we're doing this because it works. They're talking right past each other. Works, whether it works or not, is, is really dependent on what you're trying to accomplish. So if one person says, we're going to raise taxes because it works, another person says, hey, we're going to lower taxes because it works, I'll bet you works means two different things to those people. So one of the things that you want to do when you're fighting for a cause, when you're debating, when you're influencing, when you're in activism, is you want to def don't say works or worked or work. You want to define that term. You want to make sure that what you're doing, number one, works, <laughs> and that, and that you, you're explaining to people what that definition means. What does it mean to work? You know? So... Can you give an example? I absolutely can. So... Uh, the first example up here is uh, like the sanctuary county and municipalities like Needles um, and a couple of other, uh, a couple other cities um, have become sanctuary, Second Amendment sanctuary cities or Second Amendment sanctuary counties. And a few years ago, there was a big push. I was getting phone calls and emails. We should be a sanctuary county. We should be a Second Amendment sanctuary county. Okay, so some cities and counties did pass that. And then Virginia had 91 counties out of 95 become Second Amendment sanctuary counties. Did that work? 
So define work first, right? Say again. For in, in Virginia, but I would. But did the sanctuary counties do anything? Did they did they actually uh, change public policy? Did they actually you know move the ball forward in any way? I would say that the sanctuary doing that was purely uh, symbolic. I don't think it got anybody else involved. I don't think it raised any more money. Sanctuary cities and counties didn't protect your Second Amendment rights in any way. All the laws stayed on the books, stayed the same. All the laws were enforced the exact same inside those counties and municipalities, the exact same. Virginia, I thought that a lot of it shared order with the people. That was the whole thing is they said that we were not, they were not going to enforce the laws. But So the sheriffs, but who enforces state laws? State, you know. State police. So, um, for example, if let's say San Diego, say the sheriff said, we're not going to enforce any gun laws. And let's say every s police department said, well, we're not going to enforce any gun laws either. Then who would enforce gun laws? Yes. CHP. CHP in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. So what I'm saying is, is it horrible that they made sanctuary cities and sanctuary counties? No, it's not horrible. You know, did, they, did, did, did it provide a, a, a platform to do some messaging? Yeah, they got out in front and said, hey, you know, Second Amendment's important. They got to, you know, talk a little bit about their rights. But did it actually, did it work? I'd argue that for the most part, that didn't work. It didn't really do anything. It didn't really change anything. I'd also argue that um, that's not the way the Constitution works. You know, by saying, hey, um, this sheriff, this uh, police chief, whatever, they're not going to enforce the law. It's not the way it's supposed to work. The way it's supposed to work is that we're supposed to get involved we're supposed to pick our representatives, and if they pass something that's unconstitutional, we're supposed to take that to court and get it ruled on. You know, there's a bunch of different avenues, but not doing anything, you know, or, or doing something symbolic that isn't actually having a change on your uh, on public policy, that's that doesn't that doesn't work. That doesn't that's not what activism is. Um, so again, good PR. It gave people a rally point. That's great, you know. But for the most part. Um, we didn't. We didn't follow that. We didn't do a bunch of pushes for sanctuary cities or kind of anything, because it didn't. It didn't do what we defined as work, you know. Um, so what it did not accomplish: zero change to public policy. Uh, didn't change the narrative from the opposition. In other words, there was no cultural change. The op there were nobody from the opposition said, "Oh, sanctuary city. Okay, you know what? Maybe I should rethink my position here. You know, maybe we are being too extreme. Maybe that what we're doing isn't con is unconstitutional. Didn't do any of that." I would argue that it didn't work. Um, so at, a couple of years ago, Virginia, you were talking about Virginia. They had, we actually had a couple of representatives there. A couple of my family members who live in Virginia went to this big, huge march in Virginia that had to do with gun laws because they elected a new group of people and they put up some, some anti-gun laws. And tens of thousands of people went to Richmond and they had this big march. And, uh, you know, it was generally considered to be a success. Everybody talked about it and covered it and said it was great. All that's true. All that's wonderful. I'm not discouraging people from, you know, marching and being hurt or anything like that. But did that work? There really weren't any policy change that resulted from it. You know, it didn't really actually change anything. So they had 30,000, 40,000 people walk around the, the, uh, the Capitol. What is a much better use of time for 30,000 people? If they really want to change public policy, well, they could watch, walk precincts and get somebody elected. You know, where were those 30,000 people when it was time to get people elected that wouldn't ban their guns? You know, when we're talking about being effective, marching to the Capitol and making a lot of noise doesn't work. It doesn't change public policy, doesn't change the narrative, uh, doesn't protect anybody's rights. But... Uh, walking a precinct saying, hey, you know what, this person, this is our guy, this is our woman, we're going to get this person elected, let's get those 30,000 people uh, to, to work on their campaign, rather than after the fact, march, make a big whole lot of noise. So marches, protests, not something that we're, we're really focused on, it's not something that we do. Now there is really, there was one big example of a march working. And that was 1965 in Selma, Alabama. Um, and why did it work? What's the difference? Why did that march work, but the other marches didn't work? Because in that march, um, a bunch of African Americans and, and their supporters uh, uh, marched. They did a walk. And for the first time, 
the rest of the nation watched a police force beat civilians just for, for walking and just because of, of their, their cause and what they were doing, literally beat them. They saw it on TV. Now, TV was young. You know, you didn't, people didn't have iPhones and film every second of their life. So for the entire rest of the country to watch a police force, you know, beat a group of people simply for walking, you know, for peacefully walking, that changed the culture. People saw that and said, wow, now I get it. Now I understand why they're protesting. Now, now I'm going to call my representative and say, hey, I just turned on the TV and saw something horrific. We're going to change the, you know, my, the culture has now changed, so we're going to change public policy. Anything short of that hasn't really worked. I can't really think of any other examples where a march or a protest has worked, by the way, I, by the way we, we're, we're trying to define it, right? Um, <clears throat> but that's a big difference. Uh, so what activism is not? Um, basically, so let's start with what activism is. We talked a little bit about it. Activism is anything that you can do to you know, raise money and raise people and change culture and change public policy. Activi what is, what, activism is not Facebook posts. It's not arguing with your uncle at Thanksgiving. You know, it's not... Uh, arguing with your niece who just got done with her first semester of college, you know, and suddenly has a lot of weird, wacky ideas. That's not activism, you know? Uh, it's not really changing public policy. It's certainly uh, barely changing any kind of culture. Letter writing and phone calls. I think 50 years ago, letters and phone calls were probably a pretty effective thing to do. But these days, nobody cares about letters and phone calls. They don't actually do anything. When you go to, who here is pro-Second Amendment? Raise your hand. Loves the Second Amendment. If we elected you to the assembly and you went up to Sacramento and they were going to vote on a gun ban, would you be for or against a gun ban? 100% against it. How many phone calls and emails would it take to change your mind? Exactly. <laughs> and I got to tell you, everybody's the same. When they're elected, by the time they're elected, especially to Sacramento or Washington, D.C., by the time they get up there, they already know what they're going to vote on. You know, 90% 90, 90 of, the, of the issues, they already know where they, where they land. Maybe there's some nuance here and there. Maybe there's something way out of left field that they, oh, well, you know, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe you should be able to own a weasel in California. You know, something, you know, way out of the mainstream that, you know, snuck up on them. But on gun issues, phone calls and emails, if you have the time, do it. Is it activism? Well, if you define activism as something that you know, is effective in changing policy and in changing culture, I would say that writing, writing emails, making phone calls, not really all that effective. We still use it every now and then. We've certainly upset some people and gotten their attention by you know, sprinkling them with phone calls. We just did it a couple months ago. Who here gets the email from San Diego County Gun Owners? So 511, you guys remember that? Yeah, yeah. well, we changed their minds. <laughs> That was great, you know, so, um, but by and large, for the most part, if you're spending uh, the majority of your time or a significant amount of time of activism, writing phone call or writing emails and making phone calls, probably not the most effective thing. Lawsuits, not really activism, right? Um, in a way it is, it's kind of halfway in between because a lawsuit can change public policy and certainly can change culture, but for a lawsuit to be activism, you have to be what? The attorney, the plaintiff, you know, or the guy writing checks to the attorney. <laughs> That's about it, right? You know, knowing about a lawsuit, reading every little nuance about a lawsuit, understanding every update and where the lawsuit is, that, is that activism? It's fun and it's interesting and it can cause uh, some interesting conversations. But for the most part, paying attention to lawsuits, not activism. It's not, it's not really moving the ball forward. Write a check, you know, write a check to the attorney or whoever's funding it, Firearms Policy Coalition, San Diego County Gun Owners, whatever, you know, make sure that they have the resources to pay the attorney, but pouring through hours and hours of articles, analyzing, well, it could go this direction or it might go that direction, or here's really what they're, it's not really, not really uh, activism. And the reason I bring that up is because before San Diego County Gun Owners, and the reason I designed San Diego County Gun Owners the way I designed it, it was very frustrating to me 
when I talk to people, hey guys, this bill just passed. Yeah, you're gonna have to sue. That's it, <laughs> you know, we're putting all our eggs in that basket. You know, what can I do? I'm not an attorney. I'm not a plaintiff. You know, what can I do? I can write a check for a hundred bucks or whatever and help, but there's gotta be more to it. This isn't effective activism. You know, complaining and hand wringing and saying, well, somebody's gotta sue, it's not activism. So uh, that, that's the reason I bring it up. <clears throat> Enormously expensive. Oh, uh, you're just out of place. So there's a section in the main in the main uh, there's a section in the main uh, presentation where I talk about uh, don't show up with like NRA t-shirts or from my cold dead hand t-shirts or Gadsden flags or whatever. Oh, the whole big thing. Um, if you're you know going to a city council uh, meeting or if you're going to a county board meeting or something like that. You're just as out of place in an office building and shooting gear as someone who's wearing a suit and a duck blind. So that was, you know, look the part. That was that part. Okay, so let's talk about the Second Amendment. Is that what it actually means? I was shocked. Um, you know, years ago when I was all motivated and uh, they were looking for someone to run their fundraising dinners. Uh, the NRA was looking for someone to run their fundraising dinners. So I applied for the job. And the first question in the interview was, what's the Second Amendment? I couldn't recite it. <laughs> It's pretty embarrassed. And uh, I found that whenever I ask people to recite it, this is something that we're so passionate about. We spend so much time and energy on and how many of us have it memorized? Well, I decided right then and there that was never gonna happen to me again. Um, it's only 27 words. So uh, let's talk a little bit about it. I would recommend everyone memorize the second amendment. If you wanna be an effective activist, the most embarrassing thing that can happen in the middle of a discussion is, well, what exactly is the second amendment? Uh, well it's, uh, well, it's about guns, uh, you know? <clears throat> so it seems very basic, but it's also very common. So well-regulated. Uh, a few years ago, many years ago, 10, 15 years ago, there's this guy running for, for Congress, and he was actually a, a constitutional professor at Stanford, and he was a Republican. And uh, they asked him about guns on the radio, and he said, well, it's, it, it says well-regulated. So that means we got to regulate it. There needs to be a lot of laws that, you know, talk about da 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 That's not what well-regulated meant back in 1791 when they wrote well-regulated. Well-regulated at the time meant um, uh, basically if, if something was well-regulated, it meant that it was quality made or it acted as it was designed. When you talk about like surveying equip equipment, you know, if it was junky survey equipment, you know, you wouldn't describe it as well-regulated. If it was very precise and good and well-made and something that was uh, accurate and a professional use, it was considered well-regulated. So when you talk about a well-regulated militia, you're talking about a group of people who can act as a militia. They can act, they're actually, they're armed as a militia. They're trained as a militia. They're, they're people that can, you know, if you, basically if you have two groups of people, you know, and one of them doesn't have any guns and they're standing there you know, uh, uh, you know, in, in business suits and you have another group over here and they have firearms and they, you know, magazines and they seem to know what they're doing, which one's well-regulated, right? So <clears throat> well-regulated does not mean that there are a bunch of laws restricting your rights. That's not what well-regulated means and that's not what it has ever meant. Well-regulated means that the militia has the ability to act and function as a militia. Militia, so what does militia mean? Militia is a, uh, a non-professional um, fighting force. In other words, that's not their main job. So uh, if you're in the army, you know, and you're in the infantry, or you're a Marine, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, your job is to be a warrior. You're a professional warrior. If you are, uh, you know, a civilian, you know, in the United States, um, and that's not your profession, and you're defending our country because that's what needs to be done. You're the militia. Militia is, uh, you know, simply a group of people acting as a as a military force, and that's not their main profession. Why is that important? Because for a while, the argument about the Second Amendment is, well, we have the National Guard. As long as we have the National Guard, then civilians don't need to have guns. We've fulfilled our Second Amendment requirement. You know, we, you have a National Guard. That's all it is. They're the militia. Well, that's simply not true. It's completely and totally untrue. That's not what was meant at all. So how many branches of military do we have? Well, three or four. We've got five now. we got the Space Force, right? 
Let's start there. That's awesome. Space Force, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, we're trying to the Navy, but let's let's call it right. Coast Guard now, okay. So how many of those branches were mentioned in the Constitution? Anybody? Actually, just the Navy. In the Constitution, they talk about funding the Navy. It was never the intention of the Founding Fathers to have a professional standing army, certainly not an Air Force or a Space Force. <laughs> the intention was that if something was happening, you were being invaded, um, you know, and at the time, they were, well, who were they most worried about? Great Britain, right? So if you were being invaded, your neighborhood, your, your state, if you were being invaded, the intention was that everybody, you know, especially able-bodied men, would meet in the town square and they'd defend, right? Well, in order to do that, what do you have to have? Well, you have to have arms. You have to be able to act as a militia. You have to be well-regulated. That was always the intention from day one. So when we talk about the state, they're not actually talking about uh, like California. They're not talking about a state as we've organized it today. The state was really just uh, a political body. In fact, this comes from Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which was, the, I believe, the first version of the dictionary. A political body or a body politic, the whole body of people united under one government, whatever may be the form of that government. So basically, uh, that goes back to that uh, uh, state militia, uh, the National Guard. Um, <clears throat> is, uh, you know, because that's the state, right? The state uh, in the, in the, in the uh, Second Amendment. Oh, well, that's not true. All there, there's a much broader uh, definition when it was written. Um, it didn't mean each individual state. That was a total distortion of what was being attempted to be done by the Second Amendment. Keep and bear. So keep means own, right? Just like it does today. And bear means carry, just like it does today. Um, so it's not one right. The Second Amendment doesn't protect one right. It's actually two separate rights. Your right to keep or own, and your right to bear or carry. That's why CCWs are protected. Arms. So this is a really, really important uh, point. It, they weren't just talking about muskets, you know. If they were, they would have, what would they have said? Muskets. It was a very intelligent mo move by the Founding Fathers to say arms. And when they talk about arms, you know, they say, well, gee, they didn't have anything like we have today. They didn't have machine guns. They were just talking about these muskets, blah, 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 blah. Totally untrue. It's totally untrue. In fact, uh, should I stay behind there, Shauncee? Sorry. So um, they actually, civilians had, they would capture and have cannon to fight against the British. Um, in fact, the uh, firearms that they used for hunting were actually uh, far higher quality than what the British were using in war. War were using, or uh, the British were using uh, smooth bore, you know, almost, they were like big shotguns, really, you know. Um, meanwhile, the colonists to hunt a deer had rifled barrels that they custom made. Um, they could, you know, easily make shots, accurate shots at 100, 200 yards. Um, I would argue that the firearms that they used for hunting that the civilians had were probably far more lethal than the muskets that the British had. Because what, what, what was the type of the style of warfare back then? Well, they'd all line up and just kind of point at each other and shoot. In fact, uh, you know, ready, aim, fire, right? Everybody's heard ready, aim, fire. That was taken from the British, but that's not the British version. You know what the British version was? Ready, steady, fire. And when you'd, you'd ready, and when you'd steady, you'd actually look away because the blast would blind you and then fire. Well, Americans said, ah, we're gonna aim. <laughs> we're gonna try aiming, see how that goes. And that's when it turned to ready, aim, fire. Um, so the idea that they were trying to only protect muskets or that you weren't supposed to have military grade weapons is, is a complete fallacy. It's totally wrong. Absolutely 100% totally wrong. That being said, even firearms made for, for hunting are still as protected by the Second Amendment as they are. I, I think we've made a big mistake. 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, we started going, oh, wait a minute. No, we're talking about AR-15s, not M-16s. They're not made for war. I think that was a big mistake. If we're, we're on one hand, we're arguing that, oh, an AR-15 is significantly different. 
You know, it's, it doesn't have three burst. It doesn't have full auto. It's significantly different than weapons of war. And then on the other side of our mouths, we're arguing for the Second Amendment, which clearly was written so that what we could do what? Act as a militia, a well-regulated militia. Now, if you had a firearm that wasn't intended to be used in war, does that fulfill a well-regulated militia? No. Now, I think what we were trying to do is we were kind of trying to pull a fast one, you know, and trying to fool them. Oh, no, 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 don't worry. It's a small caliber. It's not an M16. It's totally different, completely, totally different. I think that's a big mistake. I think what we should assert ourselves and say this absolutely is appropriate for sport, for defense. And by defense, I mean home defense. And I also mean in case we ever have to defend our country against a foreign invader. And that's why it's protected against the Second Amendment. I think we should absolutely assert that because number one, it's true. Um, but number two, I don't think we should hide anymore. You know, we kind of had this battered gun owner syndrome for too long. And I think we should assert ourselves and explain ourselves because we're the good guys. So arms, very broad term. A stand of arms consists of a, of a musket, bayonet, cartridge box, belt, and sword. But for common soldiers, a sword is not necessary. That's actually how they define it in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. But clearly the intent was to make sure citizens can own the arms uh, that they would if, if serving in a militaristic scenario. So homework, got a couple of things for you guys to read. Um, the Founder's Second Amendment by Stephen Halbrick. You can also listen to Gun Owners Radio. If you want to, you can take a picture of this. The Founder's Second Amendment by Stephen Halbrook is the best Second Amendment history book I've ever written or <laughs> read. Um, you can also listen to a couple of interviews on Gun Owners Radio. We had him on the radio and interviewed him at least twice. Really interesting attorney and historian. Rules for radicals. Now, if you're a Republican or tend to be on the right side of the spectrum, me telling you to read Rules for Radicals is, is probably, you know, uh, you know I, I sound like a heretic. But when I put together this seminar, someone asked me, it was actually Joel Anderson when he was in the assembly, he said, hey, you need to do a How to Be a Second Amendment Advocate or Activist seminar. So I said, okay, I started interviewing people and pulling this together. And one of the last things I did is at the suggestion, I read Rules for Radicals for the first time by Saul Alinsky. And like 90% of what I had already come up with was in Rules for Radicals. Now he was an advocate for communism. So when you read Rules for Radicals, take out communism and put in the word Second Amendment, and it's actually some very effective ways to organize people and, and affect public policy. So at the very least, um, I would argue that most of the uh, anti-Second Amendment folks are, are following that as a roadmap, so it's probably a good idea that you, you find out exactly what types of things they're doing. But I would read Rules for Radicals and have read R Rules for Radicals from Saul Alinsky. I think it's a very important uh, book for uh, Second Amendment advocates here. Watch the movie Selma. We just talked about the march. It was a fantastic movie. Uh, they stuck pretty, pretty close to the history. Watch the movie Milk. You guys know who Harvey Milk was? Harvey Milk was the, uh, claims to be, I, I guess he was, I don't really know anybody else, but he was the first openly gay uh, politician, I think, in America. And he was a supervisor in San Francisco. By the way, how many people knew he was a Republican? Do you know he was a Republican? Harvey Milk. So he, so San Francisco is both a city and a county. So they don't have a city council. They just have a county board of supervisors, but it's the, the county is the city. And so he was the city council slash county board. Um, and he was elected. Why, am I, why should you read his or watch his movie? Because he, as an elected official to move his advocacy forward, used economics perfectly. And how did they do that? Well, everybody's familiar with the rainbow flag, right? How did that start? He, he started an initiative that if your, if your bar didn't have a rainbow flag out in front of it, you weren't gonna get any customers. And if it did have a rainbow flag out in front of it, they would flood you with customers. So what, would, what, what happened? Well, there were bars that didn't care anything about his issue. Didn't give a crap. But what did they care about? What? They cared about money. They cared about being, going out of business. So boom, they're flying a flag. Here you go. Come on in. Buy beer from me. He used economics perfectly when it came to uh, advocacy, and it was really well done. Gandhi with, with Ben Kingsley, 1982. Who saw that movie? It's been a long time. But if you go back and watch it, you'll see what a genius uh, Gandhi was. You know, he's known for uh, 
uh, peaceful protest. It was very effective um, in the civil rights uh, 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 initiative in uh, India. Uh, I got to tell you, he was up against uh, impossible odds and got a lot of positive things done for, uh, for, the, for the folks in India. Watch those three movies and read those two books. Increased pedigree. So we talked a little bit about that. NRA, San Diego County Gun Owners. Any board, any title you can pick up and take seriously. If there's a board or a community um, uh, group, uh, join it. You know, be serious about it and be the Second Amendment uh, person in that group. Blogs, articles, and columns. We, we, there's a lot of people writing a lot of opinions. Um, I don't know if we need more blogs, articles, and columns, but if that's your thing and your passion, then write about it. Make sure they're well-researched and useful to people. These are must-knows. You might want to take a picture of this. If you're going to be an advocate, if you really want to make a difference in Second Amendment advocacy, you have to know who your congressional representative is. You have to know who your assembly member is, what assembly district you're in. Your central committee is uh, Republican Party is run by their central committee. Demo excuse me, Democrat Party is also run by their central committee. Who's your, who are your central committee members? Not just in the Republican Party, but in the Democratic Party too. Your mayor, your city council, and your county board. How many people don't know who their county board of supervisor rep is? Really important. Check it out. Um, you know, it's, it's also uh, fairly useful to uh, just go through the exercise and figure out, well, here's where I live. How do I know what district I'm in? Do a little research. Oh, okay, I'm in District 4. Who's my representative? You know, <clears throat> if you don't know who the policymakers are, how can you change the policy, right? So you should have all these memorized. And then get to know them. You know, hey, you're, I'm in your district. So left, right, R&D. If you're a Second Amendment activist, you're not left, you're not right, you're not Republican, you're not Democrat, um, you know, you're not conservative, you're not liberal, you're Second Amendment. Um, that doesn't mean you can't be a Republican or you can't be a Democrat, um, but when you're talking about the Second Amendment, what I've seen far too often with uh, different advocacy groups is they're not, I gotta tell you, like for example, the LGBT um, activism in San Diego is not LGBT activism. It is Democrats using the LGBT platform to get more Democrats elected. And it completely loses credibility. And I'll give you an example. How much support does Carl DeMaio get when he runs for office from the LGBT community? They hate him. They hate him. It's the same with the NAACP, the black Republican or conservative candidate. I think you're probably right. Um, I'm just, this is my personal experience with, 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 with this group, but, uh, um, you know, Carl DeMaio is a very effective and openly gay politician. You know, he's run for office. Minority? Yeah, he's a he's, um, Latino. I don't think he is. Carl? Carl DeMaio? Well, in any case, he's, uh, in any case, he gets no support from the LGBT community. None. Because he's, he doesn't line up with with the Democrat Party platform. Now, you've lost all credibility there. So the reason I bring that up is resist the temptation and call yourself out on it. Are you, when you're doing Second Amendment activism, are you just trying to get more Republicans elected? Or are you truly caring about the cause? Because I know it's difficult. There are so many things to care about. Taxes, immigration, abortion, you name it. But when it comes to Second Amendment activism, when you're doing Second Amendment activism, you have to throw all that away and say, you know what? This person's the right person for the job when it comes to the Second Amendment. This person's the strongest. Doesn't matter if they have an R or a D by their name. Um, you know, and if we just turn into an arm of the Republican Party, then we're, it's, it's a total lost cause. We're no better than what they're doing. I'm not, I did not start San Diego County Gun Owners to help the Republican Party. I started San Diego County Gun Owners to advance the Second Amendment. I would argue that yes, you know, Republicans are, are better friends than the Democrats, but the reality is in politics, there's no friends. There's just temporary allies. And if we endorse a pro-gun Democrat, it's gonna make Republicans more pro-Second Amendment, and it's gonna show Democrats the advantage of having extremely uh, uh, dedicated Second Amendment people behind you. Is that right?
Now, let me ask you this. We got her elected, 100%. Sure isn't, but she's done a fantastic job for, for this so far. Now, let me ask you this. I want you to imagine your enemies, your political enemies. I don't care what, who they are, what they are. I don't care what group it is. You know, think of the five things that, you're, that you care about, whatever it is, whatever political hot buttons those are. Just think of those, okay? Whatever it is, whatever party or group or subgroup, whatever. Now, imagine if those five people, okay, that you disagree with on whatever that subject is, imagine if those five groups were as passionate about the Second Amendment as you are. Imagine if all of them agreed with you on the Second Amendment. Isn't that a better world to live in? Now, you didn't change their mind on whatever else, taxes, you know, whatever, texting and driving, wearing a helmet when you're riding a motorcycle. I don't care. Whatever it is. You didn't change their mind on any of those things, but at least they're not taking your gun rights away. Isn't that a better world? I run into people all the time who, like, why, do you, why are you meeting with so-and-so Democrat or so-and-so, you know, they don't say anything about guns. They're, they're, they wore an orange shirt on, you know, gun violence, whatever day. Yeah, I know. I'm trying to convince them not to do that. <laughs> I'm meeting with them to build a bridge. I want to show them how important what we do is and why they should care about it. It's a better world. Well, but gee, I don't like where they stand on taxes. Yeah, I, I agree. But don't you want one more thing to agree with them? I mean, maybe you should start San Diego County, you know, taxpayers uh, pack, you know. But I started San Diego County gun owners pack. I want everyone to agree with us on the Second Amendment. It's a better world if the parties aren't using us as a political football. It's a better world if... Uh, you know, we don't have one party that takes us for granted, the other party that makes us evil. So to be an effective activist, it, it, when it comes to the Second Amendment, I would argue to put all that other stuff away. Labels like Democrat, Republican, liberal, Democrat, or liberal, conservative, all that. Because I've argued with conservatives that are anti-gun. I've rewarded liberals that are pro-gun. We've endorsed Democrats that support us. And we've worked against Republicans that don't. Oh. Just tell me who dealt with one Biden stuff. There you go. Uh, Lawrence Reed is a, very, is a fairly famous libertarian. Anybody heard of Lawrence Reed? Really well-spoken guy. Uh, he has 10 rules for advancing liberty. I'm going to suggest that you s s switch the word liberty out for Second Amendment. I'm not going to read everything. I'm just going to blow through this. Again, this is uh, you know, condensed down from about an eight-hour lecture. So number one, get motivated. Get motivated, right? Uh, learn. Uh, more precisely, never stop learning. So continue to learn how can you be an effective activist. What, what else is going on in, in, in the uh, Second Amendment world? Continue to learn. Be optimistic. It really bothers me when I talk, no, nothing, nothing good is ever going to happen. Oh, you guys are having a gun show. What's the point? Where nothing ever good is going to ever happen. Be optimistic, man. We're having a gun show. They tried to take that away from us. Here we are, right? We got a Second Amendment advocacy group that's 3,600 people strong and growing. Be optimistic. You know, I know, it's, you know it seems like it's three steps back and one step forward. I get that. I get that we live in California. But man, you can't give up. And you can't sit there and complain and Eeyore and gee golly gosh, nothing good's ever going to happen. Be optimistic. Use humor. Raise questions. So rather than lecture people, I, guys, we're the worst at this. Uh, ask your wives, uh, you know, ask questions. Well, gee, why, why do you have that opinion? Well, what makes you think that guns are dangerous? Well, how did you come to the conclusion that only cops should have guns? You know, ask questions uh, rather than lecture them. No, you're dumb. That's stupid. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, liberal. You know, rather than lecture them, ask questions. Figure out where they're coming from. They may not uh, disagree with you as, as much as you think, and they may have come to that conclusion a whole different way than you thought. So if you're going to try to change their mind or stand next to you and march forward, you got to figure out what's making this person click. So ask questions. Show that you care. It's been said that people don't care what you know if they don't know that you care. I was on a podcast about a month ago with a guy who, uh, he's a pastor <clears throat> at a predominantly black church down in East San Diego. And he was kind of the, you know, the voice of gun restrictions, and I was, you know, the Second Amendment voice, and we got to talking, 
And, he, and it, it, I'm paraphrasing, but by the end of it, it was very clear the way he said that he wasn't really all that anti-gun. But when he's out there fighting for his community and cleaning up the neighborhoods and trying to convert people and doing all the good things that he does, who's standing right next to him? Moms Demand Action, Brady Organization, all these anti-gunners, right? So he didn't care what I had to say until he knew that I cared. And they cared, so he's wide open to what they had to say, right? So there's actually some things that we're doing. I said, wow, that's a really, okay, well, let's figure out what we can do. I wanna show that we care, because we do. And so we're doing some things together. Show that you care. Seize the moral high ground. <clears throat> so we're gonna get into this a little bit more, but rather than just bark, well, it's the Constitution. It's the law of the land. It's my right. Rather than do that, you know, talk about, you're, you're, you're the one, seize the moral high ground. Hey, I want, to I want people to be able to defend themselves. I want a single mom in a bad neighborhood to be able to defend her three kids. You know, I care about her. You know, one million to three million times per year, somebody stops themselves from being the victim of a violent crime. Why would you want to take that away from them? Seize the moral high ground. Uh, develop an appealing pers persona. I haven't figured out how to do that yet. I'll get back to you on that. So if anybody figures it out, let me know. Uh, don't demand total acceptance. This is tough, you know? No, but I got to tell you. It's easy. I totally agree with you on this. Well, yeah? I, say, I go, I never agree with anybody. I can't agree with myself 100% of the time because I can often see both sides, like you said, and keep in somewhat of an open mind or maybe have the ability to change your mind. So you can't demand everyone to be totally accept everything. I think you'll never, make, you'll never get where you live. I think the clearest sign of weakness that someone can show is their inability to change their mind. Um. But I'll tell you, it's tough because so, well, all right, yeah, own a pistol, all right, maybe a CCW, but I don't really like those assault weapons. No one should have those, you know? So do I, do I lay into them about assault weapons? No. Okay, well, let's see what we can do about that. Let, let's get you a CCW first, right? I don't, they don't need to be pure. Let me just, ah, let's just take one step at a time. What would you say about eating an elephant? There you go. <laughs> Make allies, not enemies. I got to relearn that lesson every day too. So let's talk about activist activities. So activism, you're a force multiplier. What does that mean? So in military science, a force, force multiplication or a force multiplier refers to a factor or a combination of factors that gives personnel or weapons or other hardware the ability to accomplish greater feats than without. So <clears throat> if you have a knife, it's just you and the other guy, right? You have a pistol. That's a force multiplier. With a knife, you're defending against a person, you can defend against that one other person. And if you're really good with a knife, maybe two. But if you have a gun, how many people, you know, three, four people, you can probably defend against three or four people with a gun. That's a force multiplier. Now you have a rifle with 30 rounds. How many people can attack you and you have a rifle with 30 rounds? I don't know, 10, 15, you know? And then if you have a machine gun, you can hold back an entire squadron or two. That's a force multiplier. Right, one-on-one -on -one with a knife. Now you wanna multiply that force, boom. You give them a better weapon. An activist is a force multiplier. So you have, I guestimate we have about 40, 400,000 gun owners in San Diego County. So um, you have to basically look as if you're representing all 400,000. That's what a force multiplier does. Um, so, so, okay, so the purpose of an activist is to appear to be many. And like I said at the beginning, um, it's, it's always a big compliment to me when people say, hey, you know, what about your headquarters? Well, I don't have a headquarters. Um, but because we're a good force multiplier, we make it look like we represent all 400,000 of those gun owners in San Diego County. So here's an example. Rather than spend $100 on a campaign, spend it on a fundraiser for a campaign. Okay, so Fred Smith is going to run for office. Now you could get, and Fred Smith's great on the Second Amendment. Right? I don't know who Fred Smith is. I'm making that name up. So don't go Google Fred Smith. Mike says Fred Smith's our future. No, make that name up. So you could write a check to Fred Smith for dog catcher and boom, he'll use that money and that's a good thing to do. What if you take that $100 and buy some coffee and buy some, some Entenmann's, right? Print up some flyers and get all your neighbors to come over. You get 20, 30 neighbors, 15, 20 neighbors to come over get Fred Smith to show up, and each of them writes a check for $50. That's a force multiplier, you know? That's taking an evening out of your day and saying, hey, you know what? 
rather than give Fred Smith one $100 check, I'm gonna give Fred Smith 10 $50 checks for my friends and neighbors. You know, that's a force multiplier. Rather than walk a neighborhood, organize a neighborhood walk. Rather than make a phone call, organize a call night. Rather than tell a representative you disagree, show them you re represent a group of people who disagree. Um, in op-eds, use terms like I and many like me are concerned. Uh, you want to make it look like you're a massive force, because you really are. It's just, you know, most of us, most folks that are uh, gun owners are raising kids and fighting through their career and, you know, trying to make rent, you know? So you got to be their, you got to be their, their force. Um, does that make sense? So whenever you do something, first ask, does this activity directly result in a change to public policy? Um, we talked about joining a group. So join a group, find it. Here's a step-by-step, -step, four steps. Find a group that you're passionate about. You have to be passionate about it. You know, you can't be a poser because <clears throat> they'll sniff that right out and they won't care about you. Show up in a meeting, introduce yourself. Hi, it's my first night and I'm here to get active. What projects are you focused on? Help lead and focus. Don't just show up and be a wallflower. Say, hey, I want to be the committee, blah, 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 for the subcommittee, whatever, blah, 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 right? Be a leader and then work from a Second Amendment angle, however that is. We're running out of time here, so let me join a campaign, walk your neighborhood, friend raisers versus fundraisers. I just gave an example, 100 bucks, some Entenmann's and some, some Kool-Aid, and boom, you got a fundraiser. One-man war, conduct a push poll. Um, ah, we're running out of time. I'll tell you what, let me just open it up to, to questions because we, we, he, he wants to give you some free stuff. What questions do you guys have? That's, just a, that's at least five tips. It's all about effective activism. And again, that was one hour of an eight-hour seminar. Yes, sir. So I got a, oh, sorry. So I got a question for you. As far as like you're saying, activities that divert people. And so I think it's one, one of the best ways I know from listening to you guys on the radio, other people. So you get the people who are anti-gun or people who are scared of guns. And many times you start for example, I took my wife out and went to see a pistol shooting. And I said, "Hey, I want to get you on the AR-15." The first thing was, "Oh, well, it's going to have a lot of recoil. It's going to be scary to snap." And once you, I said, "No, it's not. Just try it out." She shot it. She goes, wow. She goes, I really love shooting. That was even more fun than the pistols. Yeah. And I think that I try to, like, if you're saying with targets, I find people, especially, and I think of this way, if you're talking about what rights, I always say, like, Second Amendment rights are women's rights. To be an advocate. 100%. Women, you know, they need that. And a lot of women out there, they want to have the protection, especially now with the crime that's going on and whatnot. So if I can target people, we have a lady in our neighborhood that's been recently divorced. You know, she found out that I do about guns. I said, no, mm -hmm. I'd be more than glad to take you shooting like the air. And she needs to take some of these people that are on the edge and maybe politically or kind of leaning towards the left and get them involved, teach them a little bit of the shooting, make them feel comfortable, make them see that when all a bunch of crazy people are on yeah. the stuff like that. They are comfortable with it and they enjoy it because they're finding that I think that more people that as they slowly get involved, they start to change because they learn more and they realize, hey, I do have the rights. I want to be able to protect myself. And I think even we see this nationally is that more and more right, right now, there's an increase of people that are buying guns. It's, a, it's black women and women period for the ones that all 100%. so we have two programs we have our shooting socials that we have once a month and then we also have our women's group the not me when when i when i came up with not me i said it, it, there was a there were a couple of stories about the spike in violent crime and there was some anti-gun uh language in some of these stories and i was like you know what we're gonna do something about this so the idea with with not me was we wanted a program where women could purchase a gun uh get the training they need to get a get a permit not information on a website, but we're gonna assign them a volunteer and, and she's gonna help her buy that gun, get that training, get that CCW. It's a no nonsense thing. And I started talking to guys about it. I said, hey, here's my idea. And all of them said, ah, that's, a little, that's a little aggressive. And I started talking to women about it and they said, hell yeah, you know, stop uh, domestic violence and stop sexual assault. So I, by giving me a gun, I'm in, let's do it. So I stopped talking to men about it then just talk to women about it, and it's been enormously successful. I completely 100% agree. But do you think that's a small part as far as like each one of us, if you have people, a neighbor, somebody's name, and they're slightly interested, or just inviting someone, hey, let me take you shoot. Yeah, I would, but but I'm, I'm going to selfishly say <laughs> that uh, what I would do is say, hey, let me get you involved in San Diego County Gun Owners, not me, or let me get you involved in their shooting social. You know what I mean? Hey, I'm a part of this program. This, you're going to meet a bunch of great people and blah, blah, blah. Let's get you, let's, I'll go with you. We'll go down and we'll do the shooting social, you know, and, and, you know, I'd get them involved in our program. Cause you know, anybody else? What are the questions you have? It's excellent for that. 
years to get 400,000 donors in San Diego County. It's a guess, guesstimation. So what I did is I looked at what the percentage of gun owners is estimated across the country, and then I backed it off by about 20% because it's San Diego. It's probably even a little high. One thing I really started to realize a couple years into San Diego County gun owners is in San Diego, the laws have been so bad. There's an entire generation, maybe a generation and a half of people that grew, didn't grow up around guns. Uh, I'm, I'm meeting voters that are 40 years old who've never touched a gun, and I'm trying to tell them to care about the Second Amendment. You know, they're like, well, I don't, I've never touched a gun. So that's why we started our shooting social program. Um, so the 400,000 might be even a little high, but that's what I did. <clears throat> so it was low, yeah. Yes. We noticed lately that the CCWs have skyrocketed in the last six months. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, when we first looked, it was what? About 5,000 5, in the last 000, year. June now it's like, yeah. Yeah. Still about, still about two yeah. Do you know how many we need to do? Uh, but not, 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 it was about, about half that, about, about 4,500, 5,000. It was about, it was closer to that yeah. like a year ago, but. But they're now averaging well over 700 new CCWs a month, and it's taken a huge bite out of the queue. Because Q. CCWs are just going faster than uh, oxygen. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. We got our cards within days. We put our paperwork in on our hers on Monday. We had our, they were issued by Tuesday. We got them by Thursday. I, the sheriff's election. No, that was initial CCWs. All. So I'll, I'll end with this because he wants to give some free stuff away and I got to go do a radio show here real quick. But the, uh, uh, I got to tell you, I'm enormously proud of our last sheriff's election for two reasons. One is we really stuck it out there for a sheriff who's panning out in a good way. She's doing a really good job. That doesn't mean I'm not keeping her, holding her feet to the fire and I'm not, you know, checking up on her or whatever. Um, but it means that everything she promised, she is delivering on. Uh, she's been wonderful. The other part of that, though, the other side of that coin is her opponent, this Hammerling guy. I am enormously proud that we kept him out of office. That guy was as dangerous to, he should be nowhere near power. He, I'm, I'm enormously proud of San Diego County Governors for vetting him out and, and figuring out what a toxic, horrible, waste a politician he was and keeping him away from power. Anyway, thank you guys. We're going to give you some free stuff.